So that's what we still have to account for in the basic model, that neither wages nor prices are completely unresponsive to the current state of the economy. So we have some sort of stickiness, but not a complete unresponsiveness, basically. There will also be supply shocks that we need to incorporate, and the inflation rate uh, can be, and in generally will be, positive. So we will allow for a positive inflation rate. And the adjustment to future inflation depends on expectations of households. And here on the next few slides, I will present a few ad hoc formulations of the new Keynesian Phillips curve. Later on, we will derive the new Keynesian Phillips curve um, with expectations and so on, uh, based on micro foundations. How does such a Phillips curve look like? Now, on this slide, I depict a typical modern formulation of the Phillips curve, but it is as of yet not micro founded. So we will talk about the micro foundations later on. According to this Phillips curve, inflation itself on the left hand side, pi t, would depend positively on core inflation, pi t asterisk, that could be, for example, the inflation level that um, forecasters or agents in the economy expect. And it depends positively on the gap between actual GDP and potential GDP. So if actual GDP is above potential GDP, that implies that the economy is uh, in some sense overheating, so producing more than the long run uh, potential is. So it has more employment than uh, its equilibrium employment level, and that would lead to higher wage demands and further on to higher inflation because firms pass on the higher costs of higher wages um, to the consumers to some extent, and that increases prices. And finally, we would allow for a positive uh, inflation shock that can be interpreted as a positive supply uh, shock here in some sense because the Phillips curve is also uh, akin to the AS equation that we know from the AS AD models. How do different formulations with respect to core inflation look like that basically give rise to different types of Phillips curves? Well, there is a kind of uh, adaptive expectations to some extent, which lead to the accelerationist Phillips curve, in which uh, inflation expectations would be basically inflation from the past period. So if people observe a high inflation rate in the past, they would adapt their expectations and also expect higher inflation in the future. In this case, the equation that we've seen on the previous slide, it's basically the same except for the fact that core inflation is um, replaced by inflation of the period before. And what we would have then is that for inflation to keep stable, we would have um, uh, that the output needs to be at the potential output level, basically. If output exceeds the potential level, we would have an acceleration of inflation. So as long as uh, output stays above its potential output, inflation would rise um, uh, yeah, indefinitely, basically, as long as uh, output is above uh, potential output. The shortcomings of this formulation is that core inflation itself is not explained. So any level of core inflation would be sustainable as long as um, actual output is equal to potential output. Um, and it is not really uh, anchored to some extent. And basically the model implies uh, a trade-off between output and ever accelerating inflation, but that means that agents themselves would consistently form wrong expectations. They would always expect inflation from the previous period, although again, uh, output would be above its potential level and then inflation would rise further, but that would not be consistent with rational individuals who at some point um, uh, yeah, check what governments actually uh, do, that they uh, consistently try to raise actual output above um, potential output. And so in rational uh, actors in reality would adopt their expectations at some point uh, to capture this persistent um, yeah, difference in the policy that they expect from the one that policymakers indeed implement. Now these shortcomings gave rise to another formulation of the uh, Phillips curve, namely the expectations augmented Phillips curve that is actually augmented by rational expectations. So that the um, uh, core inflation is then given by expected inflation 
and expected inflation is basically formed on rational expectations of households and agents in the economy. Now, what we would have here is that um, households, agents are to some extent uh, intelligent, they know how the model works, and if the policymakers try to surprise them at each moment in time, they would learn and um, uh, basically learn how policymakers uh, behave and then they would adjust their expectations accordingly. So, for example, if the central bank um, would um, communicate uh, an inflation target of 2%, but then act in a way that actually leads to inflation of 4%, then households would adapt at some point and not expect a 2% inflation rate anymore, but would expect a 4% inflation rate. And that means that um, policymakers cannot surprise households um, anymore in, in this uh, case, or not consistently um, surprise households, and therefore they cannot permanently raise output above its potential uh, rate, even at accelerating prices. The reason is that households would um, find this out and would um, uh, change their expectations with respect to inflation accordingly. The shortcoming of this formulation is uh, mainly that it has rather strong implications uh, for household behavior and actually for the knowledge that households have about monetary policy that are not supported by the data in various uh, ways. And most importantly, there is typically some inertia in wages and price inflation that the model would actually rule out. How can one address uh, this? Basically, via the formulation of a hybrid Phillips curve, where uh, inflation is actually a weighted average of the previous two cases of the adaptive expectations and the rational expectations case, where a certain fraction of people would have uh, rational expectations, let's call them phi here, as Roma does in his um, book, and the fraction 1 minus phi would then have adaptive expectations. In this case, there would be some inertia in wage and price inflation. The extent of this uh, inertia is determined by the fraction of people with rational expectations versus the fraction of people with adaptive expectations. So one can steer actually the model uh, basically uh, to, to have a better fit with empirical findings. And then it can be tested again um, against the fraction of people that indeed uh, show some form of adaptive expectations versus rational expectations. Now we would actually be done. We would have um, three equations describing the economy, the new Keynesian IS uh, curve, the new Keynesian LM curve, and a Phillips curve, a certain formulation of the Phillips curve. But there is still uh, one problem, and this is that the uh, LM curve is written in terms of the price level and not in terms of inflation. And it's quite um, complicated to incorporate inflation dynamics in this LM curve formulation. And the second shortcoming with the LM curve here is that central banks actually don't conduct policy in terms of uh, uh, changing money supply anymore. They basically change interest uh, rates and adopt certain interest rate rules, such as the Taylor rule, for example, that reacts to certain underlying fundamentals in the economy with respect to the uh, interest policy. So what Roma does uh, in his book is to introduce an MP curve, a monetary policy curve, that substitutes for the LM curve. And it has the form that the real interest rate is a function of the output gap, which is again the difference between actual output and um, potential output, and the inflation rate, where basically the derivative of R with respect to the two arguments is positive. So if the output gap um, is uh, increases so that actual output is um, further above uh, potential output, the central bank would react with interest rate rises. And the same holds true if inflation is higher or becomes higher, then also the central bank would react with increasing the interest rate. So the interest rate depends positively on the output gap and inflation. So basically the curve then retains central features of uh, the LM curve, but it is more realistic so that the central bank um, affects uh, the interest rate with its uh, policies and it incorporates inflation, which is what we uh, need for the uh, model to be dynamic in this sense. Now we can summarize the new Keynesian model with the ad hoc Phillips curve, so that is not micro-founded yet, and it does not yet incorporate um, the expectations 
uh, that, that, are, that are forward looking. So in this case, we would have a new Keynesian IS curve as given by the Keynes Ramsey rule, where the logarithm of output has a negative uh, relationship with um, the uh, interest rate. And we have uh, the log of future output here, but we not, do not yet have uh, expectations uh, in this uh, IS curve. This will come later on. Then we have the MP curve that substitutes for the LM curve. That's the central bank interest rate rule, and it could be formulated in uh, terms of a Taylor rule. It's exactly the equation that we have before, so that the real interest rate reacts positively to increases in the output gap and to increases in inflation. And finally, we have the Phillips curve, that is the AS curve of uh, this model, where um, inflation depends positively on core inflation, the output gap, and we have the um, supply shock uh, here. The AD curve would basically be determined as a downward sloping curve in the space of inflation and uh, output by the intersections of the new Keynesian IS curve with the um, um, monetary policy uh, curve, and that would be the um, aggregate demand curve in this model. In general, this model would be very complicated to solve, so it's not possible to do that analytically. So typically, these models are simulated, for example, in MATLAB. However, with this simple formulation, uh, you can simplify it even a bit further, as Roma does in his book, and then it's possible to get an analytical solution for the effects of a demand shock or a shock to the IS curve. And the simplifications that uh, Roma applies are that monetary policy depends only on the output gap and not on inflation. So that's the first simplification. And in addition, this monetary policy curve is linear and the constant term is uh, zero. Then shocks hit only the IS curve. So in principle, it can hit uh, all the three curves that we have um, here. But uh, the simplifying assumption here is that there are only demand shocks. So there are only shocks to the IS curve. The other uh, shocks uh, are basically set to zero for the time being. And these shocks follow an autoregressive process of order one. Then potential output is normalized to one, such that uh, the logarithm of potential output is equal uh, to zero. So that's basically we measure everything in deviations from uh, potential output, so from the long run trend. And if we normalize it to one, then even all the terms that um, are related to a potential output just drop out of the formulation of the model. And for the next slides, just recall the notation that lowercase letters are equal in this chapter here to the logarithm of uh, uh, the variables with uppercase letters. Now, with these uh, simplifications and the assumption that uh, the Phillips curve is um, such that there are adaptive ex expectations, uh, we have that inflation is given by past inflation plus a function of um, uh, actual output because potential output drops out uh, because it's one and its logarithm therefore is zero. And lambda here measures the reaction of the inflation rate to increases in output. Then we have the central bank policy rule that does not depend on inflation, but just react to changes in the output gap, where again, potential output drops out. And we have a reaction uh, parameter of the central bank B. So the central bank reacts at the strength B to increases in output with increases in uh, the interest rate. Then we have the new Keynesian IAS curve. Here we would have the term of future output. Of course, we don't know future output yet, so we write it down as uh, the expectation of future output. So ET is the expectations operator, as it was in the Ramsey, uh, in the real business cycle model. Then uh, output depends negatively on the interest rate, and we have the IS shock here. So that's the demand shock, and this demand shock follows an autoregressive process of order one with an um, autocorrelation coefficient of rho IS. And EIS would then be the shock that hits at one point. The parameters that I described here are all um, uh, positive. Uh, so lambda is positive, B is positive, and theta is positive. And the autocorrelation coefficient here is between minus 1 and 1. And it's strictly greater than minus 1 and strictly smaller than 1 to have a stationary um, uh, shock here. To solve this uh, model, we plug in the interest rate from the second equation into the third equation for the IS curve to get to the expression that we have uh, here. And then we isolate on the left-hand side 
the term yt. Now, if we do that, we uh, see that yt itself depends on the expectation of yt plus 1, so on future output. Um, and the strength uh, of this dependence is given by theta divided by theta plus b from here. And uh, uh, by the shock, uh, by the IS shock, um, with the same coefficient, basically. And then we summarize this coefficient under the parameter phi that is smaller than 1, because you divide a theta by theta plus b. And that basically gives the, resp um, the response of um, output two changes in these two variables. Then we can iterate this expression one period forward. So just changing the index, adding plus 1, so we would have output at time t plus 1, then being uh, dependent on the expectation at the information level at time t plus 1 of output at time t plus 2, again with the response, um, the strength of the response being measured by phi. And we have uh, then the technology, uh, the DIS shock at time period t plus 1 here. And then we can again take expectations of that. Uh, as of the information at time t. Uh, if we do that, then we would see that expectations at time t plus 1 here actually drops out because um, expectation at time t from expectation of some future time period uh, where we don't have yet any information is the same as the expectation as of time t of this variable that um, realizes at some point in the future. And then we have the IS shock here that is multiplied by phi, and if we put in the shock for period t plus 1, that's basically due to the autocorrelation coefficient rho of the shock at time t. Next, we can plug in this expression for the expectation of the realization of output at time t plus 1 into the expression that we have for output at time t. So we substitute out for the expectation at time um, uh, of output at time t plus 1, and get a term then that is the expectation as of time t of output at time t plus 2. And we see already where this leads us because we can do this step successively, substitute out for all of these expectation terms, and that's basically done uh, here. And then we get uh, basically a chain of um, autocorrelation coefficients and the responses to these shocks multiplied by the shock and the limit when n goes to infinity of the expectation at as of time t of output at time t plus n. Now, since uh, phi n, the response, uh, is raised to the power of n, the limit here goes to zero and it drops out. And the only thing that we have to consider is this uh, geometric series here that solves to be equal to uh, phi over 1 minus phi rho i s times the uh, shock to the is curve at time t. So then we see there are no expectation terms anymore. So we were able to substitute for today's output, uh, well, it's all for today's output by substituting out all the expectation terms into the future, such that it only depends on uh, today's shocks and the parameters in the model. And then we can just plug in uh, the um, uh, phi here, which was uh, theta over the uh, theta plus uh, b, and if we do that, then we arrive at this final um, expression. Now, what we see here is that the strength of the monetary policy response, which is um, captured by the parameter b here, dampens the effect of shocks. So if b is higher, then shocks would say the paribus have a lower effect on output. And the higher autocorrelation of shocks, rho i s, increases the impact of shocks because we subtract rho i s or a function of rho i s here and that increases the coefficient of u t i s and therefore we would have a stronger effect on output of such a shock if the autocorrelation of the shock is higher. Without any forward-looking behavior in the IS curve so that we would not have um, output at time t plus 1 here but output at uh, time t, the effect would have been smaller, basically. So then yt would be a function, again, of the IAS shock, the function being um, the term theta over theta plus uh, p, so phi. Uh, and we note, actually, that the reaction that we have here with this term is greater than the reaction that we would have had here, because the autocorrelation term shows up here in the denominator with a negative sign, and that magnifies the effect. 
So forward-looking consumption behavior magnifies the effects of shocks to demand as long as these shocks are persistent. So there is some autocorrelation.